Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm, you know, uh, I think as everyone getting through this strange world that we're in at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. Thank you so much for doing this interview with me. Oh, it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you for, <laughs> thank you for inviting me. Uh, so we'll just go through questions and just let me know if you need a break or anything um, throughout um, and we'll just see how we go. Uh, can you give a brief explanation of what mast cell activation syndrome is? So uh, mast cell activation syndrome is one of the conditions that I live with. And uh, mast cells are a type of white blood cell that are in the body. They're one of the most primal parts of our immune system. And they're called in to respond to things like uh, bacteria, viruses, parasites, venom, uh, tissue trauma, but they're also what's implicated in allergic response. And so in someone who has, for example, an IgE mediated allergy, then the mast cells are called in, they degranulate, which means they kind of explode with hundreds of different chemicals that cause all of these inflammatory uh, symptoms within the body. Now in mast cell diseases, which there's a whole range of them, um, there's a dysfunction of the mast cells. So in some of them, you might have too many mast cells. In some of them, you might have mast cells uh, of a normal number, but they're just really hyperactive and they will respond to almost anything. And I have a kind of um, severe variant of mast cell activation syndrome, which is um, a little bit partway between mast cell activation syndrome and monoclonal mast cell activation syndrome, where I have both too many mast cells and they're hyper, hyper reactive. So that means that my body kind of has a really intense immunologic response to thousands and thousands of triggers, which we would normally not think of as, um, as problematic for our existence. But for me, my, you know, my body can have a very severe allergic response, including uh, anaphylaxis to all sorts of things like um, food, the odor of food, heat, vibration, sunlight, um, smoke, uh, but also for me and for a lot of mast cell disease patients, many, many of these triggers localize around things like chemicals and things that are petrochemically derived. Um, and uh, also things like plastics and synthetic textiles, all of these things that we've built into our modern world that are made of these materials. And so um, it's almost like being allergic to, to our modern environments. What is the most important thing for people to know about your condition? There's a, um, a wonderful mast cell disease researcher. Um, well, she's a patient advocate and scientist, and she has a talk that's called, Yes, You Can Be Allergic to That. And that, I think, is the thing I would put out there, that, yeah, it sounds really strange. But when people have this type of disease, um, and it can range in severity from very mild to um, the sorts of people like me who have to live in controlled environments. Um, but yeah, something can be a trigger. And e even if um, it's in a minute amount as well. Wow. So you mentioned how uh, the mast cell activation syndrome could restrict your day-to-day -day functioning in life. What does uh, having this syndrome mean for your day-to-day -day life? When I was younger, um, because I've had this uh, syndrome my whole life, it's just gotten worse as I got older. Um, it used to just mean having to avoid certain foods. And then I had to avoid being around certain foods. Um, and then when it got really bad, um, I had a major escalation event about six years ago and that's when the disease uh, baseline gets worse and I then um, actually breathe the normal air outside because of the sorts of triggers that might be in that air 
So if the neighbors have hung their laundry out on the line and they use fragrance laundry powder, the particles of that could come in and I, I could have anaphylaxis. Um, I can't be around people or food or so many textiles, um, ink, you know, I can't read a book. So I live inside a positive pressure air sealed safe room, which is a small room I've been living in for the last six years. And it means that the air in here is uh, filtered in a particular way to make it safe for me to breathe. And um, there's nothing in here that can be harmful to me. Uh, so that's, it's very limiting. It's very limiting. Um, you know, I can't use a computer. I can't read a book. I can't, um, I can't use pens or pencils, like very simple things like that. I can't open the window. Um, so it's incredibly, incredibly limiting. And that means to go outside, I have to wear specialist protective equipment, um, which includes for me a uh, elastomeric respirator mask and an oxygen tank. And that I always need to have um, a lot of care around me people who can respond to the emergency situations that might come up if I'm in contact with any of these triggers that range from food to fragrances to all of these things. Yeah, definitely. You mentioned the, um, the importance of filtering in your air because obviously you can have a reaction. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think that the impacts of your syndrome would decrease if you ventured into less polluted areas and more natural environments? They do. And um, to me, it's a, a beautiful example of the way the social model of disability plays out in illness. Um, the social model of disability is the understanding that disability is actually, um, it's relational. It's not something about the body. It's the interaction between a body and a space, um, whether that space is physical or sensorial or attitudinal um, or a societal structure that does not support that particular type of body. And so we, we talk about um, it's spaces that disable, not bodies. So if I go out into nature, so let's say the middle of a nature reserve or something, I can take my mask off and I can breathe and I feel normal. Uh, normal in inverted commas. Um, I, I, I'm not having the kind of symptoms um, that I would be experiencing if I opened the window here in a suburban setting uh, or if I was around the sorts of things other people keep generally in their houses or around the people um, because the disease is it's trigger dependent and it just happens that in nature it's not that there are no triggers um, there are some plants that I can't be around uh, if we have bushfires and things like that of course the smoke is a major major issue um, I have to be careful of sunlight and heat to an extent, but yeah, um, it, it, it feels incredibly freeing to be out in, but the more pristine the nature is, the safer it is for me. The catch 22 there is that even though being out in the middle of the bush is amazing for my mast cells, it's not particularly, uh, wheelchair friendly and I'm a wheelchair user because of one of my other syndromes. So that, um, yeah, that makes it a little bit difficult trying to navigate that kind of space. Yeah, that would be very difficult. Um, I just thought I'd check in to see how you were doing, if you're up for a couple more questions. I am. I'm going okay. Thank you. Awesome. No problem. Uh, so how do you interact with your friends and family? Like this, online. Um, when, when I have access to online, I don't always have access to online. Um, but when I do, it is that kind of yeah, slightly long distance kind of thing. Um, and then also uh, looking out my window. Um, I'm very fortunate that I do have, um, you know, a window that I can see the outdoors from here. And sometimes my um, little niece and nephew, if um, you know, pre-pandemic, if they came around to visit, they'd come and stand outside the window and say hi. Or in the morning I can look out and... I can greet, um, I guess, the kindred of nature that's around me. I, I, in the morning, I'll look out the window and I will greet country and I will greet the trees and I can, and the, the animals that go by. And so I have a relationship in that way, even though I can't be out in nature in the way that I would like to be. 
Yeah, definitely. Uh, so we often talk to our school community about how significantly plastics are infiltrating our environment, in particular microplastics. Do you think this type of human pollution has added to your health condition? Yeah, um, undeniably. There are a lot of mast cell experts who talk about this and how the kind of things that we've put into the biosphere um, like microplastics and a lot of the chemicals that we use in creating plastics or with plastics like major endocrine disruptors like phthalates um, which are also used in fragrances um, so these kinds of there's a lot of stuff that's going into the biosphere and then of course we're part of the biosphere that's going into us and the immune system is having uh, what it appears to be like a very um, major response to these things at two levels. One is that experts are noticing that these kinds of um, substances that are going into our bodies have an effect at an epigenetic level and it's upregulating the genes that drive these sorts of conditions. Um, and so that's why we're seeing a greater incidence of atopic diseases, um, different sorts of allergic diseases, different sorts of immunologic and autoimmune diseases um, in response to this. But these substances um, with mast cell disease, they are also triggers for the disease. So not only have they increased the incidence in, uh, in society, generally in people like myself who have the genes for this, but um, then when we come into contact with those substances, it makes the disease and the symptoms worse. Yeah, well, thank you. I'm glad you brought insight to that because I think a lot of people don't connect the two and I think it's important to make that connection. Uh, if you had been born 300 years ago at a time before ultra significant human impacts on the environment, do you think your health would be different? Yeah, yeah. Um, we don't know for sure to what extent mast cell disease existed back then. Um, we don't know if it's a kind of natural phenomena that has just become worse and worse through mutation, through um, contact with these sorts of substances that have come into the world from industrialization. But um, even if it had only exist, even if it did exist back then, it would have been very mild and it would have been manageable. Um, yeah, it would have been a very different situation. And so I, I think with these diseases, you could really classify them as um, kind of climate crisis mediated or um, industrial world mediated diseases. Yeah. And yeah, I wonder, I wonder what it would have been like living in a different time. Yeah, definitely. So skin completes, things like eczema, free leaf rollers, etc., all seem to be becoming more common among Earth's human inhabitants. Do you think this is attributed to the way humans have changed the planet? Yeah, um, the, the, uh, these diseases, they have, they have the similar underlying mechanisms. And so when you do have things like... Um, asthma, um, breathing issues that are allergy related, um, psoriasis uh, or things like um, even kinds of responses that are inflammatory from biotoxins like mold illness and things like that. The mast cells are what are coming into play there. And uh, yeah, um, that's, that's as I said before, it's, I, I do think they're absolutely connected. Yeah, definitely. So do you think many people see that climate change is an exacerbator of pollut uh, pollutants in our atmosphere? Do you think they make that connection? No, I think a lot of people kind of view just the earth generally as a backdrop mm -hmm. for the human experience rather than recognizing humans as part of nature and part of the world and the biosphere. And so they kind of see it as this passive thing that we're affecting rather than something that is active and we're in relationship with and it's creating these feedback loops. And um, it actually makes me think a lot about my condition 
because with mast cells, we can talk about there being all these triggers that are coming in from the outside. Um, like, let's say I come into contact with someone's perfume and that causes my mast cells to, degran uh, to degranulate. But another trigger for mast cells are the chemicals that mast cells release when they degranulate. So it creates a feedback loop. And so a mast cell degranulating makes more mast cells degranulate. Uh, in the same way that, you know, we have these mega bushfire blazes and that is increasing the amount of air pollution uh, and carbon that is being emitted. So it's, yeah, we have these feedback loops that are happening. Yeah, I really liked the analogy that you used about um, Earth being a backdrop. I think that's a really good way that people do see the world. And I think that's a problem. Uh, so your performance art is obviously important to you, given you persevere with it despite everything. What motivate, motivates you to continue? I'm not really sure. I think um, often with artists, making art is the way that we process the human experience and it's also the way we connect with others and speak to them on a level which is uh, maybe speaking to something that's a little bit um, broader than just you know analytical language um, speaking at a level that's you know uh, emotional um, maybe it's a little bit spiritual or just kind of human centered this this connection and um, I think I just didn't know how else to process all the experiences that I'm having or how else to keep connecting with a world that I've been isolated from. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so I've just got a couple more questions for you. Uh, do you think most people understand how many pollutants and toxins can be in everyday items and food? No, <laughs> and I, I didn't either. And I thought I was very well educated about this before I became sick. and it was really eye-opening to have to go through all the research that I have to to keep myself safe. And a lot of boring conversations with manufacturers and companies and dealing with um, this kind of opacity around what is in stuff. A lot of places don't know what's in the stuff they make um, or they won't reveal that. And then the stuff we do know is, is quite shocking. Yeah. and the way that it's not regulated. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think I didn't realise that just the amount of, of really harmful substances that are in our food and in our personal care products, especially. Um, I, I, I always remember being a student and learning about Elizabethan times and, and the kind of, lead that would be in the the face products that they would wear and the makeup and I would you know people would shake their head and think oh wow they put lead on their faces that's so dangerous and horrible but I think in the future people will look back at our era and think wow what what were they putting on their skin what were they putting into their body yeah. um yeah. Uh, so my last question to you is in a strange way has COVID made the world a little more normal for you It has, um, in that it, it, there's no longer a kind of cognitive dissonance between my experience and the rest of the world's experience. They're starting to understand things like um, that you can have tiny invisible things in the air that can be very dangerous to you, that can travel fairly large distances, um, and understanding about vectors of contamination, the way that we're actually connected that we, we didn't realize before. Um, but in other ways, it's, it's, still not, it's still not normal. It's not normal for anyone. Um, I don't think any of us want to be living like this. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for doing this interview with me. It was really awesome to get to talk to you. And I know I learned a lot. And I think that you provided an insight on how climate change can have really dire impacts on people's lives and I think that was really important so thank you so much thanks for having me